Morning. Welcome to a new season of Polaris Live. This is your host, Sarwar Kashmiri, welcoming our viewers from around the world to these series of discussions on China and America in the world. This program is brought to you live in conjunction with the Foreign Policy Association of New York. My guest today is Professor Kishore Mahbubani. He is one of Asia's most accomplished diplomats, academics, and is a renowned observer of the U.S.-China relationship. He's a distinguished fellow at the Asia Research Institute, National University of Singapore, a prolific author with provocative, hard-hitting books, including Has China Won? The Chinese Challenge to American Primacy and Can Asians Think? He's received numerous awards, but he often points to the Foreign Policy Association's gold medal as one of his most prized possessions, which of course warms my heart because this program, Polaris Live, is produced in conjunction with the Foreign Policy Association. So please welcome the distinguished professor from Singapore, Kishore Mahbubani. Good morning, Dr. Mahbubani. How are you? Uh, good evening from Singapore. <laughs> it's, uh, you surely don't. I'm in Singapore. <laughs> you surely don't have ten centimeters of snow on the ground in Singapore. Absolutely not. Uh, <laughs> I can assure you that if you come to Singapore, Sarwar, we'll give you a very warm welcome. Oh in Any God. month of the year. <laughs> and and you and 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 will you take me out to one of those hawker dinners? Absolutely. <laughs> Listen, first of all, thank you very much for taking the time. I know you have almost every second scheduled all year. You're either writing or speaking or, uh, you know, and, uh, but you and I spoke, uh, Kishore, a year ago when America and China were at daggers drawn, right? Presidents have changed, officials have changed, but we're still there at daggers drawn, America and the U.S., the most consequential relationship in the world, right? Just today, I was reading that uh, uh, that Secretary of State Blinken uh, said that China has uh, become a much more aggressive force in the world, and in return, China uh, has uh, uh, has decided to put, uh, not yet agree to the face-to-face -face meeting uh, with uh, with the U.S. because of the boycott of the of the Olympics. So, what's happening here? Can you explain? Well, I mean, it's not surprising uh, that the U.S.-China geopolitical contest is gaining momentum because it's, div it's driven by a powerful structural logic that is 2,000 years old at least. And so, you know, and, and it's, you know, as, as I also doc document this in my book, <coughs> China One, whenever the world's number one emerging power, which today is China, is about to overtake the world's number one power, which today is the United States. The United States is behaving quite rationally in trying to stop China from becoming number one and in trying to keep its number one position. So to that extent, the American behavior is rational and predictable. But of course, how you manage a geopolitical competitor requires a lot of shrewdness, uh, diligence, cunning, understanding and a deep understanding of the adversary that you're dealing with. And here I would say the United States overall has done a very bad job of under, uh, understanding China. And many Americans think that they are uh, overestimating China's capabilities. Actually, they are underestimating China's capabilities. And so one, one of my roles as a friend of the United States is to tell the United States, why don't you step back for a minute, press the pause button on the US-China contest, and look carefully at what are real American interests uh, in the world today. And at the end of the day, the fundamental choice the United States has to make is, does it push for the primacy, is primacy in the world, or does it take care of its people? And that's a big choice. And I would say it's wiser for the United States to focus on taking care of its people who are having a lot of difficulties, as you know, in the United States, <coughs> rather than to focus on primacy. 
And and if this, mm. if you had a wise, mm. shrewd leader uh, in the United States, mm. that would be the wise option to take vis-a-vis -vis China today. Well, uh, this is something that, uh, uh, you know, is uh, constantly in the media about the state of the economy, the state of the people uh, in the United States and so on. Uh, uh, but, but it just is quite amazing and a little bit difficult to understand why the two major powers in the world, America and China, with some of the most sophisticated electronic uh, communications and ways of speaking to one another just continue to be at this loggerheads and and uh, and and China is you know uh, the uh, thousands of year old civilization so do you not think that China ought to sit back and say hey we've handled this many times over the thousands of years so we need to be more understanding about uh, America's uh, brashness, if I may use the word. That's not to mean that's what America is. Shouldn't China show a little more uh, patience with what's happening? Hmm. Well, I think overall, uh, China is demonstrating quite a bit of patience uh, in dealing uh, with the United States of America. I think you, the, China is at the end of the day a very rational actor on the world scene. And uh, if you notice very carefully, the when the Biden administration came in, uh, relations actually got worse between US and China. You had a very confrontational meeting uh, in uh, Anchorage, Alaska, between Secretary of State uh, Blinken together with right. Yang Jiechi and Wang Yi. But I you notice that one year later, actually things have calmed down a little bit. And I think the Biden administration is gradually beginning to realize that it has got to sit back and work out a comprehensive long-term strategy because they have sent lots of senior envoys, including Vice President Kamala Harris, uh, including the Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, including the Secretary of State uh, right. Tony Blinken, to East Asia. And I think what they have noticed in East Asia, especially in Southeast Asia, where Singapore is, that the ASEAN countries, and the 10 ASEAN countries uh, matter a lot because the total population is 615 million, about double that of the United States. And these are the states closest to uh, China. And, and the message that comes through very clearly from the 10 ASEAN states is that they want to have good ties with the United States. In fact, there are huge reservoirs of goodwill towards the United States and Southeast Asia. But at the same time, the 10 ASEAN countries also want to have good ties with China. And China has been the neighbor of Southeast Asia for two or 3,000 years and will right. be the neighbor of China, Southeast Asia for the next two or 3,000 years. So it is so unwise and futile uh, on the part of American policymakers to think that they can turn ASEAN uh, against uh, China. So this is why I think it's important for the Biden administration people to spend more time listening to what the states of this region uh, are doing. And here, as you know, the biggest development that has happened in 2022 has been the launch of the world's largest free trade agreement the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which involves the 10 ASEAN countries, China, Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand. It took off in January this year. And, and that is going to bring the region closer together. And unless the United States is able to match China in, in proposing free trade agreements or rejoining the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the United States will find itself out of the big game in East Asia. So instead of focusing on the military dimension, the United States should focus on the economic dimension and rejoin the Trans-Pacific Partnership if it can. Well, I'm glad you brought up the RCEP uh, because a lot of people in America were surprised when it came into force a few days ago uh, that it created just a blip in most of the media. Uh, and it was, as you point out, the 
beginning of the largest uh, free trade area, uh, you know, and, and 600 million people. Uh, so this season of Polaris Live, we're going to try, Kishore, and focus more on the trade and economic side of the relationship. Uh, and then we'll wind up with a report for the Foreign Policy Association sometime in the summer. And my question to you is, do you think that if, if, if uh, America and China focus more on trade and economics and put some of these more contentious issues like the South China Sea and so on a little bit on the back burner, that we might make more progress towards uh, a closer relationship. Do you think that makes any sense at all? Well, I think um, the certainly the economic dimension is the most critical. And by the way, the regional comprehensive economic partnership, if you add up all the population involved, comes to about 2.2, 2.3 billion people in the world. And that's uh, uh, coming close to one third of the world's population. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, so it's massive. I mean, that's very, very important. And it involves some of the largest trading countries in the world, too. Uh, and so it's, it's the, the issues like the South China Sea, you, which you mentioned, are difficult. They need to be resolved. But uh, it's, what's interesting is that uh, the, there are four claimant states uh, which are competing with China in the South China Sea, namely Vietnam, Philippines, Brunei, and Malaysia. And all four of them are having discussions uh, with China uh, on the South China Sea. And uh, at the same time, the ASEAN countries are also trying to work out a code of conduct with uh, China on what to do in the South China Sea. So I think the United States can play a helpful uh, role behind the scenes, but it should not try to use the South China Sea issue as a way of creating divisions uh, between ASEAN and, and China, because that would not be wise. I think the ASEAN countries are concerned about China's South China policies, but they're going to find ways and means of resolving this with China through negotiations. And in, indeed, the best way for the United States to preserve its influence in this region is to continue to trade and invest uh, right. in this region. And fortunately, American investment in Southeast Asia is still much larger than Chinese investment uh, in Southeast Asia. Of course, Chinese trade with uh, Southeast Asia has become much bigger. In the year 2000, for example, to give you a statistic, uh, United States trade with Southeast Asia was $135 billion, and China was only $40 billion. China was only one-third that wow. of United States in the year 2000. But by 2020... Uh, United States trade with Southeast Asia had grown to $300 billion, which is a lot of money, uh, which is uh, grown two and a half times from 22 in the year 2000. But China's trade is $650 billion now, more than double that of the United States. So the big game, this is the important thing for Americans to learn, is the economic game. And fortunately, the United States has a strong economy. The United States has some of the world's largest and strongest and most dynamic econ uh, companies in the world. And what they should be doing is investing more in Southeast Asia, investing more in East Asia. And that's the way of ensuring that America's influence in East Asia continues to remain strong in the 21st century. Uh, Kishore, uh, uh, well said. Uh, but let me ask you, one of the issues that we keep reading about here, and I'm tangenting just a little bit, but not much, one of the issues we read about is the Chinese economy is in real trouble, that uh, the real estate bubble is exploding. And, and from your perspective in Singapore, is that true? I mean, is the Chinese economy in trouble? They're trying to hold it up when the bubble is about to burst. What do you think? Well, I think uh, <laughs> big question. If, if it is indeed true that the Chinese economy is about to implode, then the United States should just sit back and relax and not worry <laughs> about the rise of China and say, okay, China is going to implode. I can just relax and not do anything. But I think what most Americans underestimate 
is the quality of governance in China. So it is true that the Chinese economy faces some real challenges. That's absolutely true. And as you know, one of the biggest companies, uh, Evergrande, is in deep trouble and, and may very well you know, uh, disappear. But it, it, it is not surprising that China has a lot of problems. But what is remarkable is that China's capacity to handle these problems is also quite remarkable. And you notice that the Chinese didn't allow the market to, to either collapse or to just pump it up with lots of money. It's a very controlled regime to manage the re, uh, resetting of the uh, property market in, in China. And the overall, the Chinese are very much focused on the long-term strengths of the Chinese economy. So, you know, for example, when they crack down on big tech, on Alibaba, on Tencent, you know, on, on Didi, you might think, oh, the, the whole story of China's uh, success in the technological field is over. Actually, the Chinese in some ways may be doing the right thing in trying to curb the powers of big companies that could become monopolies or oligopolies and instead create a more level playing field for new enterprises uh, to emerge. And I've heard in a podcast, one of the world's experts on artificial intelligence, Li Kaifu, says he's invested in a thousand companies in China, mm. in technology. And in the past, these companies, if they started to succeed, they'd be eaten up by the giants, by Alibaba and Tencent, in the way that Google and Facebook eats up all their competitors right. in the United States. But here in China, now, now the, the companies can grow. It's a much more level playing field. So I would say in, in the areas of economic management, the Chinese will probably manage their economy better than virtually any other economy in the world. And you know, all the forecasts I see show that China is continue, will continue to grow in 2022, although it has a big challenge with COVID. And China's biggest challenge is to deciding when to move away from a zero COVID policy. That I see as the number one challenge in the short term. And we'll see how they play it out in right. that area. Another question, which uh, uh, is more is atmospheric, but important at this point, is there is a feeling, uh, at least the one when reads the media, uh, in, in in various parts of the world, that the American political trouble uh, spell perhaps impending disaster in America, democracy is in danger, and so on. What I want to ask you is: America has faced many of these challenges before. You know, the Civil War, uh, thousands and thousands of America died. One part of America, as you know better than most declared war on the other, but America has a remarkable ability to pull itself back up, its bootstraps, pull itself together again. Do you think, where do you think Asia is on this? Do you think Asia believes that America is heading into real trouble as are these headlines, or do you think Asia is still confident in America's ability to re, uh, refurbish itself? Can you well, answer that? I'm really very curious. Thing. I can tell you one thing. The most Asian countries want to see a strong United States and not a weak United States. Ah. They would like the United States to recover from its current problems and become once again a strong, dynamic, self-confident country. But uh, at the same time, most Asians are also very shrewd observers of the American political scene. And I think they are, they are beginning to realize that America's problems today are of a magnitude that have not been seen in a long time. In fact, many thoughtful uh, American observers, I mean, distinguished American scholars are saying that the last time that the United States was as divided as this was in the American Civil War of 1860s. So, this is actually not, this is actually a very deeply troubled America. And, and, and America has got many structural issues to deal with. So, for example, uh, you know, many thoughtful observers like Paul Volcker, 
the Nobel laureate Joseph Stiglitz, the Martin Wolf of Financial Times, and in my book also has China won. I will devote a whole chapter, chapter seven to this, to discussing how America has become a plutocracy. And the trouble about becoming a plutocracy is that the, the bottom 50% in the United States haven't seen their standard of living improve over 30 years now. And that's very, very dangerous. So that's created a very angry uh, white working class, a very angry white middle class. And that's how you got the incident of January 6th, uh, 2021. Uh, in Capitol Hill. So right now, the biggest worry for for Americans should not be whether or not China is a competitor. The biggest worry for most Americans is whether Donald Trump will once again become the president of the United States of America uh, in 2024 elections. And I can tell you there's one thing that many countries in the world, including America's best friends in Europe, uh, America's good friends in Japan and South Korea, for example, their number one worry is the return of Donald Trump as the president of the United States of America, because if he goes back to the America first policies and says that allies don't matter, then America's standing in the world will be very, very badly damaged. But let me uh, ask president you, Donald Kishore. Trump becomes a president again. So I think that's the number one worry for many thoughtful Asians and friends of the United States overseas. But, but Kishore, let me also then introduce a subject that there is a feeling here uh, that that China itself is in somewhat of the same situation with the vast dis, uh, the differences in uh, uh, in wealth from the coastal areas to the uh, to the interior, uh, the real estate market that we have touched on. Uh, the fact that the demographics point to uh, a non-growth period in China, uh, that uh, uh, that, uh, and a lot of people believe the only reason it's being held together is because it is not a volatile, vociferous, free-spoken, uh, democratic arena, but that uh, it is an authoritarian uh, country where everything can be held together. The only reason I bring this up is. It seems as though that there are potential issues, serious issues in China, uh, potential serious issues in America. Uh, and to me, that seems even more of a reason that the two ought to sit down and try to tame things so that both can come out of this uh, uh, together in a way that benefits uh, the world and both of them. What do you think? Well, I'm actually very, very glad that you brought that up because it is this goes back to our, my, our previous point about is China about to collapse? And you are absolutely right, by the way, Sarwar, when you say that there is the same kind of inequality in China as there is in the United States of America. The Gini coefficient uh, is quite similar, and there are also billionaires in China and so on and so forth. But the one big difference between uh, China and the United States is that the bottom 50% right, in China have seen the greatest improvement in their standard of living over the past 30 years. Uh, greatest improvement uh, in 30 years over 3,000 years of Chinese history. So uh, uh, when the, this, in the same 30 years where the American bottom 50% was sliding or going down, the Chinese bottom 50% has been going up. So yes, there's inequality, but it's a different kind of inequality because people at the bottom are actually experiencing great improvements. And that's why, you know, there's a Harvard Kennedy School study uh, by the Ash Center, which documents that support for the Chinese uh, Communist Party uh, has gone up from uh, uh, 80, uh, 83% uh, in uh, 2006 to uh, uh, 96% in 2013. You know, so that's a very significant improvement. Absolutely. The support for the Chinese Communist Party. And this is documented by the Harvard Kennedy School. And, you know, these are very serious academic peer-reviewed studies. And so the way the Chinese Communist Party stays in power uh, is not through repression, but through enjoying very strong support 
uh, from its people. And you know, from the point from the point of view of the Chinese people, the past, and this is what I also I document in my book as China One, the past thirty to forty years of economic and social development have been the best thirty to forty years in three to four thousand years of Chinese history. So they they've never experienced. So so if you look in terms of the data. Of, 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 of human well-being. Life expectancy has gone up. Infant mortality has gone down. The number of people being educated is the largest number ever in, in, in Chinese history. So if you go to China, uh, in, when you, if you actually travel into China today, and in, 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 in contrast to the United States, in the United States, when you travel in the United States, you experience a lot of unhappiness a lot of angry people who are very unhappy with their situation. In the case of China, you meet lots of happy people uh, who are very happy with their situation. And in the, in the latest year, when the Chinese could travel, in the year 2019, 139 million Chinese people left China freely, right? And remember, in the old right. days of the Soviet Union, no one could leave the Soviet Union. Just Understand. Closed. But 139 million people left China freely in the year 2019, and 139 million people went back to China freely. So if it was a repressive society, why would they go back? You know? So Listen. I think this is where there's some fundamental misunderstandings uh, of China that need to be corrected uh, in the American discourse uh, on China. I mean, I'm China going... Perfect, okay. China's got lots of problems, <laughs> but it is managing them in a way that is quite remarkable. What I would like to do is devote the few minutes that we have left, uh, Kishore, uh, on some positive notes. Uh, following on this idea uh, that the two countries uh, should focus a little more on uh, trade and economics, what I'd like to ask you is that, can we think of a couple of ways in which that could be done? For example, the, the regional uh, comprehensive economic partnership. It's such a huge part of the world, right? Uh, is it possible for America to join it? Will China extend a hand and say, hey, listen, come on in. Perhaps then the European Union could also. Uh, what can you think about a couple of areas where both China and America can show some understanding of each other and begin a very large uh, push for joint trade and economics to build on what, what already exists. Mm. What about that? Take the RCEP to begin with, the Regional Economic mm. uh, Comprehensive Partnership uh, that you just so eloquently talked about. Do you think America should join that? Will China welcome that as a, a gambit to start this? I, I think... It, it, it's it, regardless of whether it's the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP, or the Trans-Pacific Partnership, it doesn't matter anyone, America should join free trade agreements uh, in this area. And actually, uh, the, 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 what, what will surprise many Americans is that China would welcome the United States in these free trade agreements. Uh, because China believes that that's the best way of maintaining peace and stability in the world uh, is by signing free trade agreements uh, with its neighbors. And and if 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 you look at it, if you look at it carefully, if the biggest allies of uh, United States in East Asia, Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, uh, even Thailand and Philippines have joined the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, clearly America's friends are there. As, as the RCEP. So America should come in. But the more, the more realistic step that the United States can take, because I know the US Congress is very much against new joining new free trade agreements, but the more realistic step that the United States can take is to, is to for, just suspend the trade war against China and remove the tariffs that both sides have put on each other. Because as you know, uh, President Joe Biden said in 2019 in the campaign trail that the American tariffs on Chinese products have not hurt the Chinese, have hurt American consumers, American workers, uh, and the American people. So uh, Joe Biden is right. So the first thing that the United States can do is to remove all these tariffs 
And you know, America's uh, number one problem today, this year, is going to be inflation. And one of the few uh, policy uh, instruments that the United States can use to reduce inflation is to remove tariffs on Chinese products, make them cheaper, and then inflation will come down in the United States. And if inflation comes down so in let, the United States, that might be good for the United States. So let me focus now on China. You've mentioned what America can do. What is the biggest step China can take uh, to, to create more uh, amity, to improve relations between the two and trade? And you know, What can China do? Give me an initiative that China should take. Well, I think the Chinese will be very happy to suspend the trade war with the United States. And, you know, the, this is an No, but what can they do? That, that what can they do? To me, but, the, but China is a major uh, investor in infrastructure. Right. And the United States, as you know, frankly, it would help the U.S. economy. It's actually quite surprising that when you travel to China... You see first world infrastructure in the airports. You see first world infrastructure in the highways. You see first world infrastructure in the fast trains in China. But when you come to the United States, you see third world infrastructure in John F. Kennedy Airport, you know, or even Dallas Airport. You see third world infrastructure in the highways now. And you know, you, the American bridges are collapsing. This is what American society, no. civil engineers is. So I think this is there are, there, are, there are clear areas where China and the United States can cooperate with one another in a win-win uh, uh, fashion. And I think that's what uh, United States uh, should focus on, 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 on doing. And, but and let at the me, end of I the day, the, the best way to balance Chinese influence in this region and in the world is to work with China in the economic sphere and keep up with China's economic linkages with the rest of the world. No, I, I, and I, I understand what you've just said. And to his credit, Mr. Biden has, uh, you know, is the first president that's tried to get a lot of money and pour it into to infrastructure. Uh, and and uh, hopefully he'll get more. You know, this is an issue. You understand America better than most people. You've lived here many years. Uh, in fact, I remember some uh, wonderful parties in New York where uh, uh, I saw you hold a court and, and vice versa. Uh, it's not so easy, right, Kishore, in America. The states are all different. Uh, people own pieces of property. You can't just build railroad tracks. So it's not the same thing as a leader of the country, as Mr. Xi Jinping just said, uh, that we are going to try and re-kickstart the Chinese economy by putting in 2,500 miles uh, or so of brand new high-speed rail track. I mean, you can't do that in America. But, but what I'm saying is, I'm asking for another concrete step that the Chinese could take uh, to inspire confidence on the American people maybe even as a PR kind of issue and say, hey, America, this is what we want to do. Can you think of a big issue as we wind up this program that China can say, let's do this? Well, I think the uh, China can start to import more products ah. from the United States. Okay. And I think if you can, if you can work out a deal with... Uh, uh, China, the, the Chinese will be happy uh, to do so. And, you know, uh, the, the Chinese will also, by the way, welcome American investment by American companies. And as you know, uh, lots of American banks and financial institutions have stepped up their presence in the Chinese capital markets because now they can get a full license and they don't have to share ownership of their uh, co companies in China. So there are new opportunities waiting uh, in China. And the Chinese government actually wants more American companies to benefit from Chinese prosperity because that, they believe, is the, most sta the, the best way of maintaining a stable relationship uh, between United States and China. That's why you notice that trade between United States and China 
uh, hasn't gone down. And you know, no. if you look, for example, at the most valuable company that America has, which is Apple, uh, Apple manufactures most of its products in China. Indeed. And indeed, indeed if, if, if the Chinese, for example, stop Apple from manufacturing in China, Apple would disappear as a company. <laughs> so there are, there are clearly interdependencies relationship between yes. the two sides. And the Chinese want to see more Apple production in China, want to see more American companies invest in China and do well in China. So this well, you is, know, this for is sure, a, I knew a, that a tremendous opportunity for American businesses in China today. So if you are, if I, if, if, if anyone listening to this program is an American businessman, they should look again at, at the Chinese market because the Chinese market is going to become the biggest market in the world. In fact, in some ways, it already has become the world's biggest market because if you look at the retail goods market in the year 2009, the size of the retail goods market in China was 1.8 trillion and United States was 4 trillion in 2009, more than double that of uh, uh, China. But by 2019, China had grown to $6 trillion and the United States had grown only to $5.5 .5 trillion. So the world's largest retail goods market today is in China and, and American businesses will be welcomed uh, in China. And well, you know, businesses to take advantage of. you know, uh, Kishore, I knew that some, somehow towards the end of this program, uh, we would come up with some positive ways to, uh, to, to have China take the initiative. You know, as my dear mother used to say, it takes two hands to clap. And part of this report coming out from the Foreign Policy Association and part of this season of Polaris Live is to focus equally on initiatives that China and America can take, realizing that there are all these bottlenecks as the establishment on both sides have more or less painted themselves uh, in a corner. Uh, and we need to hear fresh voices. And that's the reason I thought of starting this season of Polaris Live with you, because you are one of the most respected voices on, on both sides. You love America, you love China, you like, love Singapore most of all. Uh, so I want to thank you as we run out of time for being part of this program, for helping us launch the season of Polaris Live. We really, really appreciate that. Thank you for having me. So with that, with that, I would, uh, we've run out of time. You know, it always happens when you have people as distinguished and full of ideas as Dr. Mabubani. But that's our program for today. To learn more about China and America and the world, please visit www.polaris-live.com, where you will also find a list of the upcoming programs of the season, uh, which uh, the next time, by the way, on February 9th, uh, will uh, will uh, will feature Roy Yelenik, who is an Israeli expert on Chinese business and investment in the Middle East. He will be my guest on February 8. Uh, until then, goodbye. <laughs>